everyone, and we're live for a brand new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraum. How are you doing today, Seth? I'm good. Special All Thursday right. edition. Yes, it is. Uh, we have a little conflict, a little schedule conflict tomorrow. It's Seth uh, flying out to LA, and uh, I'm right now, why I look I look uh, <laughs> yellow, orange right now is because I'm in an hotel room in Vancouver, uh, where I'm going to be testing out... Um, the new, the latest version of Tiger's electric snowmobile this weekend. So I just came to Vancouver a little bit ahead. But with all the traveling and everything, we won't be able to do the podcast tomorrow. So we're giving you a little uh, Thursday episode right here. So it's going to be a little bit lighter on news because, again, we have one fewer days to um, of news to cover. But still, we have some very interesting stuff to, to discuss. So you guys should stick around for this one. And I'm sure we're going to have a little fewer people watching live um, because it's not our usual time. And um, we didn't have that much notice to give you guys about that. We apologize. But for those who are watching live, please don't hesitate to send us your questions or, or your subjects that you want us to discuss. We should have a decent amount of time uh, to, uh, later uh, during the show to in either answer your question or discuss specific EV topics that you want us to get into. Um, you can put that in your comment section on YouTube, Facebook, um, and uh, wherever you're watching live right now. We're going to start out some with a little bit of a preview on uh, Tesla's delivery numbers, which should come out um, this weekend. Uh, sometimes Tesla does release them on weekends if uh, the new if a new quarter starts on a weekend. Sometimes they wait on the Monday, but uh, we'll, we'll, you can always check out Electric. We're going to be the first one to post as per usual. Or maybe not. Maybe not actually. If, it, if it's on, uh, <laughs> if you're on a snowmobile, time. yeah, because I'm gonna be uh, in the the mountains in the snowmobile. We'll, we'll see. We'll, maybe we're gonna have someone else to post already. We'll we'll, we'll check on that. So <laughs> I might have contradicted myself right there. But anyway, we already have a pretty good idea what it's gonna look like, and it, it looks like surprise, surprise, another record quarter for Tesla deliveries. Uh, so last quarter was a record. Q4, 400,000 deliveries. Generally, between Q4 and Q1, there's uh, either a little slowdown, like uh, the, the Q4 is a big quarter, last quarter of the of, of the year. Q1, it's either marginally bigger than Q1 or a little lower than, uh, sorry, marginally bigger than Q4 or a little lower than Q4. This time, we expect it to be at the very least marginally higher than Q4 and maybe uh, decently higher than Q4. And uh, that's thanks, obviously, to Gigafactory Berlin and Gigafactory Texas having significant ramp up in production that this quarter. And obviously, on the demand side of things, there was the huge price cut early in January that uh, that has definitely helped Tesla maintain strong demand into a higher production capacity. And um, now we are getting some numbers from some of Tesla's uh, most of our critical markets that uh, are, are should give us a good idea of where things are going. In the US, we already reported that the price cut has resulted in unprecedented demand. Uh, model Y, which is becoming Tesla's most popular model now, uh, ran out of build slots, uh, production build slots for um, like halfway into the quarter, which is a great indication that demand is going great. There's still vehicles in inventory right now, including for Model Y. Uh, a lot of them are obviously Model Ys from Gigafactory Texas. So those are not available to order. There's no build slot. There's no production build slots for those. Just to put them in inventory or reach out to customers if they want to switch to that standard range version. So there's still some of that that's going to be delivered in the next few days. Uh, well, actually today and tomorrow. Um, but we actually expect a very strong quarter in uh, from, from Tesla in the U.S., which is the most important market. But the second most important market is China, and it's uh, it could become the most important market. And um, we have some registration data from the uh, insurance companies in China that gives us an idea of how many vehicles are being delivered in Q1 from Tesla on the Chinese market. And with a, a week left in the quarter, 126,000 deliveries, which is a new record for Tesla in a single quarter in China. Obviously, also big price cuts came there early in the quarter that helped a lot. And uh, but. At the rate that Tesla has been delivering vehicles in China in the last few days of the quarter, up until that last week that uh, we still have data from, it looks like Tesla could deliver 140,000 cars in China in, in Q1, which is massive. Um, 
Then we also reported a little bit on Norway, which obviously is a much smaller market, but they still deliver like a, an insane amount of cars. Uh, they're going to have 10,000 vehicles, it looks like, this quarter in Norway. Uh, incredibly impressive for, for a small country like that. So right now, the Wall Street consensus is 420,000 deliveries in Q... Uh, Sorry, my TV and my hotel just started by itself for some reason. Let me shut that down real quick. That was convenient. Really, I don't know. Yeah. All right. So 420,000. Uh, I'm sure that Elon loves that number. And uh, for multiple reasons. <laughs> Uh, so that's 15,000 units more than last quarter. And uh, in my opinion, anything, uh, it's 100,000 units year over year or two. So that like we always focus, Tesla is so quick at ramping up that we focus like quarter to quarter. But honestly, normally like on a um, financial analysis basis, you look year over year and year over year, it's massive, 100,000 units difference. I think anything around 420 and up is going to be very good for Tesla. Uh, it puts them at around 1.7 million units this year if they continue to maintain that rate. Obviously, we think that they're going to more than maintain that rate. Uh, but um, uh, Elon already guided about 1.8 uh, million units, though he also said that if everything goes well, it could be actually 2 million units. But we know that uh, everything never goes well. <laughs> everything never goes well. Um any comment on this set, or you you think 420 is uh, is the number? Uh, I, I mean, anecdotally, like we haven't heard any. You know, there's no parking lots full of Model Ys anywhere, right? There's no like demand issues. Tesla hasn't really uh, sparked demand. They they had done the uh, the Model X and Model S uh, free supercharging, but like that's that's not a big number. Like none of the signs point to any sort of problem in demand. And at the same time, we haven't heard of any, you know, stoppages. Like, for instance, Ford just started up their F-150 line again because of a battery issue. But they were out for like almost a month. Um, More than a month, I think. A month and a half. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's nothing, certainly nothing like that. Um, that's been part. They, you know, they retool every once in a while. But so, you know, they, they're going to keep getting bigger and bigger as long as demand doesn't fall off and they keep you know, optimizing their supply chain. So wouldn't be surprised to hit 420. Yeah, that makes sense. And you just hinted at the next uh, piece of news they want to discuss. The only concern for them is the Model S and X. Tesla offering up to 10,000 free supercharging miles, which is a decent amount of miles. Normally, like Tesla was offering like 2,000. So that's five times that. So it's um, it's a significant, well, significant. I mean, it's probably worth like 500, 600 bucks. It's not that big of an incentive, but still a decent one. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it is a bit surprising because like the Mall S and X, they are the best deal they've been in a long time with the, the recent price cuts over the last few months. Like they were part of the big price cut engineering, but Tesla continued to cut the price over the last few months, making it the, the best deal ever. And now I had years basically of free supercharging on top of that if you're on the market for model s and x it might be the time to uh, pull the trigger really all right and uh, part of the reason why 420 is very much achievable is that tesla just announced this week that uh, gigafactory berlin hit 5,000 units a week production which is the goal that they uh, wanted to achieve to consider it like actual volume production and um looks like uh, there was like this little uh informal race between Gigafactory Texas and Gigafactory Berlin. So congrats to the Gigafactory Berlin team. It looks like they won. Uh, we haven't received an update from Gigafactory Texas in a bit. Obviously, Gigafactory Texas has a different set of difficulties as uh, Gigafactory Berlin because at least part of the production and a big part of the production ramp is based on the 4680 cells and Gigafactory Berlin doesn't have that problem. Um, so, and there's also a good reason for that at the same time. And those are the, that reason or the incentives. Uh, Gigafactory Berlin actually gets some of the batteries from China. And that's not a problem for uh, European incentive on electric vehicles. While the new tax credit in the US is going to require as soon as next week to have uh, sourcing of the battery packs, uh, battery cells, not from, from China. 
so that's going to have a change. And we reported last week that's going to affect the Model 3, for example, the standard range Model 3. And uh, actually, Tesla confirmed it just yesterday that that was going to be the case. Uh, we had the exclusive on that last week. Another reason to follow Electrek. But yeah, Berlin at uh, 5,000 units a week. Now it's exciting. It means that the next vehicle is gonna probably going to be uh, deployed soon. So people are thinking, is it going to be the new Model 3, Model 3 Highland version, refresh Model 3, however you want to call it? Or is it going to be a brand new vehicle that this has these based on the next generation platform? Who knows? But we're going to keep an eye on that because it's probably going to come out soon. Yeah, do you think uh, China is going to be, be the first to see the Highland uh, Model 3 or... I mean, I mean, historically it, it, speaking, in the last few years, uh, Gigafactory Shanghai has always put out the first changes to any Tesla vehicles uh, other right. than all S and X that are produced yeah. there. So, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. And uh, we've seen some prototypes parted in, in, in China, but mostly in the U.S. So uh, maybe maybe Fremont and... Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, the, uh, if it's coming out in Q3... So it's within like the next three to six months. I would assume that it's either Shanghai or Fremont. And now, because uh, I don't believe that Tesla could deploy the new Model 3 production line during that time in Berlin. But uh, it's not impossible if they have kept everything quiet. But it, it, it's been hard to keep things quiet. Like Gigafactory Berlin, like there's always, there's so many application uh, for approval, environmental approval and all that stuff that normally we, we, we see things coming before they... Uh, they actually get into production. All right, another exclusive that we had yesterday. Uh, Tesla has poached a battery expert to come fix the dry electrode issue that comes with the 4680 cell. So that's been a, a big concern. Um, the ramp up of the 4680 cells, which Tesla, when Tesla sold us the 40, 4680 cell, it was it was a huge deal. Like here, here you see like the 5% five 5x increase in energy, 16% increase in range, 6% increase, 6x increase in power. Tesla was teasing like a 50% drop in, in, in cost, though that was not just the cell, that was also the structural battery pack, but but the cell enables the structural battery pack, so it comes together. And uh, we haven't, it's not at the level that we thought it would be by then. The cell was unveiled, of course, at Battery Day in 2020, uh, was introduced first in the Model Y produced at Gateway, Texas, but we know that Tesla has since switched to producing both Model Y with 4680 structural battery pack and 2170 with the whole structure, which shows that uh, there's a reason for that. It's like the ramp up hasn't been as good for the 4680. So in order to 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 make some money on their Gigafactory Texas investment, they had to still use the 2170. Otherwise, they wouldn't be producing enough car to justify a massive factory like uh, Gigafactory Texas. And one of the reason why uh, we heard that uh, the well, I mean, we heard Tesla has confirmed it that the, the dry electrode coating technology, uh, something that they actually acquired through Maxwell when they when they bought Maxwell Technologies, seemed like to be the main reason that Tesla was buying it, the, the company, even though the company was mostly known for its uh, ultra capacitors. They ended up selling, Tesla ended up selling Maxwell uh, ultra capacitor business to just retain basically now their, their dry electrode technology. And uh, it, it, Tesla admitted when they were uh, on Ville 4680 that the dry electro coating was not quite there yet. There was still work to be done in order to uh, deliver on that technology. Oh, am I still on or I just lost that? I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm going to keep going just to be sure. But um, yeah, so the dry electro coating technology was not up to par. And that dry electro coating technology was actually the main um one of the main advancements that the 4680 was was bringing to the table. Tesla talked about a 10x reduction in footprint for the electrode and a 10x reduction in energy need for the electrode. Um, all right, so thank you, Dan. As it looks like I'm still on. We just lost set. Uh, hopefully, he's going to be right back. I was a bit concerned because he's the one, he's the producer of the show within the, the software. So uh, I, I hope that uh, everything is still uh, on, even though he's not there. So there was there was some issues uh, on the manufacturing side of that uh, dry um, dry coating system, the powder into film system that Tesla calls it. Uh, they just haven't been able to produce it in volume at a cost that makes sense to sell. And even the Model Y that are that are using the forty six eighty, the the teardowns of the cells have shown that Tesla has not 
uh, included that, that technology in it just yet. So this, this cell is just a fraction of its potential right now. So the good news is that uh, we, we learned at Electric this week that uh, Tesla uh, hired Matt Tyler, uh, yeah, Tyler, uh, a Milwaukee school engineer, uh, educated mechanical engineer. Um, we spent the last decade working on battery cell technology and most recently at a competitor to Tesla's um, cell manufacturing process, uh, 24M. So 24M is also working on a similar concept uh, for the electrode. They call it a semi-solid electrode that doesn't use any binder or mixing of electrolyte uh, as an active material. So as, a, as, recent, as most recently, he was the uh, VP of um, Advanced Manufacturing at uh, 24M. And he's been at the company for six years working on that technology. And uh, Tesla just poached him uh, last month and uh, they made him the um, they, they made him the director of dry electro development. So it's basically going to be his job to deliver on Tesla's dry electro promises. Uh, so hopefully Tesla can do uh, can can make some progress with uh, uh, Mr. Tyler at DM right now. You're back, set. Yeah, I don't know what I guess the Thursday Wi-Fi is not as good as the Friday Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, you've never had an issue before. Uh, yeah, I was I was concerned for a second that I was not on that I was on my side and I was losing you because you, you're the producer of the show on the on the stream yard. But uh, it looks like I was still on, so we're good. Yep. All right, I was just done with the dry electrode uh, news. Okay. Uh, Tesla solar roof uh, news this week. So um, actually, that's another one that if you've been following Electrek, you have a good idea of it. But uh, with McKinsey, they are the, one of the biggest firm that follow uh, energy trends and uh, they claim to have a big exclusive this week to the first one to have inside information about the solar roof deployment of course last year we did reveal some of the first data that tesla has been kicking close to their chest because tesla hasn't been breaking down the solar panels versus solar roof deployment uh, within their quarterly release and we revealed that tesla had deployed only 23 roofs per week during the second quarter of 2022 uh, 2.5 megawatts of solar roof which is just uh uh, drop in the bucket of uh, the original goal of a thousand roof per week. So McKenzie followed up, and they uh, they claim to have some good data showing the whole year of 2022, uh, um, and and prior to that too. And they estimate that Tesla has deployed about 3,000 solar roofs uh, since the deployment of the technology in 2016. And uh, in 2022, it was an average of 21 roofs per week. Um, again fraction of, uh, of what Tesla was supposed to do, but it's still growing. That's the good news. Uh, growing in terms of uh, total deployment. So they're estimating uh, 12 megawatts uh, throughout 2022 versus just short of that in, uh, in 2021. And, um, but in market share, they see it going down. And the, the report looks like it was almost like financed by uh, Gaff Energy because it was really pushing the Timberland uh, solar roofing system, which we reported on before, which is uh, a Tesla solar roof competitor. But it's a different product because it's a nailable solar roof. So you actually, it's like it's like regular shingles that but you nail them to uh, to the roof. So it's a they, they're going after a different market. It's more like similar to other nailable roof system plus solar, rather than Tesla goes after the higher end of the market with like. Uh, more expensive like concrete roofs and, and and tile roofs and things like that but uh, tesla is trying to ramp things up too with uh, we reported before they're moving evenly into the third party uh, system in terms of uh, they want to uh, bet on third party installer rather than their own installers however they're, they're also investing on their own installers to be to, to be clear they're still installing their product but they are now have 85 third-party partners to install their own system. So Tesla has been really moving to, to sell their own ecosystem. It's not just a solar roof, but also solar panel, uh, solar inverter, and um, and the power wall, obviously. That's been the case for, for a long time. Catch us up on the uh, situation with Tesla Solar. Like I know the panels are not necessarily made in the New York Gigafactory. But I think the inverters are, or are the inverters made in China as well? I actually don't know where the inverters are made. I know that Tesla made it, makes its own inverter, so that they, they are Tesla made. Um, it would make sense that it would be made in Gigafactory in New York because uh, that's where a lot of power electronics are made, including the superchargers. 
So right. it would make sense to make the power electronics there. But yeah, you're right. The solar panels are not, they, they are custom to Tesla's. They are the new like 420 panels. Another reference Elon, to 420. I'm sure, I don't think, I'm sure I don't think. Elon was like 420 panels. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Don't, I don't need yeah. any other specs. Yeah. Um, it, they, they were kind of early to have those panels because those are kind of, they, they, kind of powerful big panels for the residential market uh, they've been, been around in the commercial market for a long time now but not not so much in residential but that was like a few years ago now and so this, there's a very consistent incremental increase in power capacity in, in solar panels for a long time now so uh in in recent years we have seen other 420 solar panels so it's not exactly unique to tesla but they claim to have their own they also have their own designs and all that so they look sleek of course it's a tesla product it has to look sleek um, but when when Tesla Tesla is more trying to own the the brain behind the um, the, um, the, the, the their solar system their their own energy system so that they can implement virtual power plant and more recently the whole electricity retailer system so that the brain is going to be obviously the inverter and also they can do it through the power wall which now include uh, their own inverter and uh, and gateway which is kind of the brain of the power wall. All right, moving on from Tesla news, we have a bunch of unveiling this week, uh, including the Q8 e-tron from Audi that was just announced. Uh, well, I mean, it was unveiled last year, to be fair, but uh, as usual with these uh, European manufacturers, they, they unveil the European version first, and then we have to wait a little bit for the US version because they do differ slightly, generally not in the design or anything like that, but in the, the trims that you get. And in case of Audi, it, the, the main thing has been... Uh, the options and on the battery side of things, they've, they've tend to only give the, the bigger battery option to the U.S. because they think that U.S. market is just not, uh, doesn't have any tolerance for a smaller battery pack. And uh, that's exactly the case with the Q8 e-tron. There was an, a smaller, like 90 kilowatt hour battery pack that was offered in the, the, the European market. And it's not available here. We just have the Q8 e-tron Quattro and the Q8 Sportsback uh, S-Line e-tron Quattro. And they both have a hundred and fourteen kilowatt hour battery pack, so that's a that's a big battery pack right there. And so the big news this week is more about the pricing. We get the U.S. pricing, and it starts at seventy four thousand dollars five four hundred, which is a, a decent price. It's not for 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 a full size SUV here. Uh, if it was produced in the U.S., it would even get the the tax credit here. I didn't yep. see any word about U.S. production just yet, though. Uh, I'm sure that Audi is looking into that, and that would be uh, that would make sense. But yeah, not only the battery pack is massive, 114 gross, uh, 106 net. So that's the Audi has always been known to having a big energy buffer on the battery pack. They've been a big concern about that. And obviously, the bigger the buffer, the less efficient you are. But they actually have reduced the buffer now. Uh, it used to be 91% of the pack that was uh, usable. Now it's 93%. So doesn't sound like much, but it's actually a big difference, 2%. And um, at the same time, another increase is in the uh, charging capacity, DC fast charging capacity. The peak charge rate has gone up from 150 kilowatts to 170 kilowatts. Still not massive uh, for a 2024 model year in the EV market. It's not top end for a premium vehicle. But at the same time, Audi has been known in terms of DC fast charging for having... Uh, for, for even though their peak charge rate is not the highest, they maintain that peak charge rate for a longer period of time, which results in a charging session that is on par with, with competitor, really. Uh, in this case, they, they did release an, uh, yeah, 10 to 80% the usual charge uh, session in about 31 minutes, which is perfectly decent. Yeah, it's decent. Um, it's not quite you know uh, Hyundai uh, eGMP platform, but I think that's probably because the battery is so big. Like uh, it's charging fast mm -hmm. and, you know, we know Audis usually have a pretty good charge curve, uh, but it's just such a massive battery that even at a high charge rate, uh, you're not going to be able to fill that thing very quickly. Exactly. That's, that's part of the concern. Some pictures here, but we already saw most of that from, from the European unveiling. Actually, this is an European version that we're seeing right now. I'm actually going to be test driving this, this car in uh, California in, early may i think or oh nice may. so i'm gonna be able so to yeah 300 miles of range 
That's yeah, nice. uh, we don't have the EP number just yet, but the WLTP are over 350 for the the bigger battery pack version. So yeah. I would I would assume that the EP range will come at over 300 miles. Uh, we won't have that until uh, we we get the the vehicle in the U.S., which is going to be again closer to the summer. This kind of uh, lines up with the uh, Polestar um, three a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Both huge battery pack. Polestar three is 111 kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. and uh, same you know size. Although I think the Polestar might be a little bit uh, like higher off the ground, but not quite as high. Uh, you know SUV looking. It's more like a a sedan. Polestar has that like elevated sedan kind of mm -hmm. look and feel. And now that makes it five uh, Audi full electric vehicle in the U.S. If you do consider the sports back to be a different vehicle, obviously it's not. It's not a massive. Uh, it's not a massive difference. And uh, we've been talking it for weeks because they've been gradually releasing new information about it, little teasers and whatnot. But now the EV9 from Kia is fully unveiled. Um, we are going to have all the specs that we're going to be able to get into, but, but a lot better pictures now than what we've seen before, too. It was a lot of the teaser images. Now we have the full pictures. It it really delivered on um, or a high expectation for the design. Kia has been knocking it all of the park lately with the EV6, also beautiful design. EV9, just as beautiful. And also for the U.S. market, it's probably going to be a big deal. Uh, thanks to the full... North American market is just super hungry for full size SUVs. Yep. Battery pack, uh, we have two options a 76.1 kilowatt hour pack for standard range rear wheel drive and a long range 99.8 kilowatt hour pack, which is going to be available both in the rear wheel drive and dual motor all wheel drive configuration. So that's uh, that's good. That's uh, like uh, Kia and uh, Hyundai. That's one of the things I like a lot about them. They're, they're big on options, they, they, they give you. Actually, like um, this is actually coming down from the um, EV6 and Ionic 5, where they they had um, they give you also the dual motor all wheel drive option for the smaller battery pack. But I I understand not doing that in this case. Like that, that's actually what Tesla does too. Is just uh, if you're gonna lose a little bit more efficiency, a little bit less range on the smaller battery pack, uh, makes sense not to have the all wheel drive version, which is gonna accentuate that. Um. So. so Everybody yeah, wants ahead. to know the price, and uh, we initially heard um, that they wanted to do a fifty thousand dollar version of this thing, but that was when it was, you know, still a prototype, and a lot of things have changed since then. But um, that init, that small battery rear wheel drive one uh, will probably, uh, you know, obviously get closest to that number. Um, you know, the seventy six kilowatt hour battery—that's pretty much what a uh, ev6 or a, a hyundai ionic 5 has so mm -hmm. it's basically that car battery in a bigger vehicle so i don't think the range is going to be too good there it's probably going to be close to 200 miles um i would imagine real world so uh you know for fifty thousand dollars maybe a 200 mile uh ev9 makes sense yeah i see scooter is a little bit um Estimated here at 300 miles for the bigger battery pack version. I think that might be a little bit optimistic. Uh, doable, though, but op optimistic. Uh, like you said, yeah, the smaller battery pack is going to be much closer to 200 miles than anything else. Likely going <clears> to <throat> likely gonna hit 200 miles, but uh, don't expect uh, anything close to 250 or anything like that. Uh, but like you said, no pricing information just yet, so we're still just estimating right now. Uh, U.S. pricing is going to come out later this year. But uh, yeah, I think uh, very doable though for the, the the starting price to be close to fifty thousand dollars. I think that's with, with the specs we're seeing here, a hundred and fifty kilowatt motor, so nothing crazy. Like no, in points. fact, yeah, I was gonna say that is not that is a low power motor for yeah. that vehicle of that size. Yeah, I mean that's the Chevy Bolt motor. It's one hundred fifty kilowatts, two hundred yeah. horsepower. Wait a minute, is that is that a typo or? What? Long long range rear wheel drive gets 150 kilowatt motor. Standard oh, yeah, range rear wheel drive gets 160. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it, yeah. Well, though imagine. it is faster with the smaller motor, with a smaller battery pack, which it would be because it's going to be lighter. 
Um, even though a better battery pack also enables higher power output, but in this case, with <laughs> the limitation is at the motor either way, so it's not going to be a, an issue. I feel like everybody buying this thing is going to go for the all-wheel drive. I think like 98% of the yeah. people buying. And even the all-wheel drive, you get uh, not that big of a second motor here at 280, 2 kilowatt. <laughs> it's like yeah. you get the, but I mean, six seconds is, is plenty. Like, yeah. Uh, most of the yeah. full size SUV and in the gasoline size, they don't they don't get nowhere near that. So right, and and it's not anywhere close to a Rivian, but you're not, you know, expecting Rivian from this vehicle. And if you want actual performance, they said that uh, there's going to be a GT Line version that's going to be a, a little bit more exciting, but they haven't released that many details about that other than uh, um, some follow us saying you won't see that okay until 2025. So we're still uh, at least two years away from that. I don't know. To be honest, like, uh, do they really need that? Do they really need like a a GT, a GT version? Yeah, I think they don't. But sure, like, look, not? look at the Model X uh, Plaid. Not a big seller for Tesla, right? Like the EV6 GT, that's a little bit more exciting. But this, this, uh, you won't see that. Um, I like the interior a lot. Uh, the uh, looks like a great implementation of the cameras for side views. Yeah, are we going to see those in the U.S.? Probably not, right? I mean, we're we're due to an updating updating rules on that. Like it's 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 time. Uh, I know that things yeah. move slowly in the regulation side of things, but uh, there's there's a it would have such a big impact. You just you just change a few things in the laws, and 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 you would have a massive efficiency gain. Like it's yeah for for probably better safety too. Like it's, I would assume better safety. All right, we sort of uh, talked about it for a second earlier when we talked about Ford, but uh, they officially confirmed today that they're reopening the F-150 Lightning orders, and they're also updating the price. Uh, <laughs> so the, the the little pause in production has created a, a little bit more of a backlog, but not, not more of a backlog officially since they actually stopped taking orders during that time too, but unofficially like the there's still uh, there was still demand being created for that truck and um the the wasn't they weren't producing any so that demand was was backing up and now they decided to reopen it today uh, but with a nice little price increase so the lariat standard range went from uh fifteen hundred dollars more now it sells for sixteen uh, seventy six thousand dollars it's not cheap. A lot more expensive than <laughs> so. The, the, all those price in, in increase are also adding to bunch of price increase that came over the last two years since that vehicle has been uh, uh, as received pricing. Then uh, you have the platinum trim that's uh, now selling for about a thousand dollar more at uh, ninety eight thousand dollars, and uh, the pro version, so that the, the cheaper version, uh, got the biggest price increase on Ferdy. Uh, it's now starts at sixty thousand dollars. Was it starting at forty thousand dollars when it first launched? Yeah, so so it's gone up from forty thousand dollars to sixty thousand dollars, basically, yeah. which is crazy. It's fifty percent. It's twenty thousand dollars more expensive. Yeah, uh, and, and, uh, you, and, and the, sh- yeah, consumers can't even buy it. It's only for fleet customers right now. Yeah, right now at the moment, hopefully it's going to open up once they uh, increase the production capacity, which they also said they're going to increase it. Uh, well. I don't think they actually updated the number. It's just more like the timeline. So they say that the 150,000 units output it's coming this fall, by this fall. Um, I hope that they could use that time where they that downtime to actually like update their uh, production lines and whatnot. But yeah, that that price increase here, like going from 40 to 60 thousand dollars, is no joke. That's a big difference, and. Um, I don't think it's like an opportunistic difference of like, oh, people are willing to pay that. I think it's more of like uh, they're gonna ha- they have to do that to to make money off of it. I think it's more like that, and also it should uh, give you an idea of what like the Cybertruck, for example, like the forty thousand dollars Cybertruck. You can also forget about it. Um, maybe the second beat can beat sixty though. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it can beat sixty for I the base one. So. You don't think so? You want to make it interesting? I bet you a side. I mean, truck. I mean, here's the thing: Tesla will be opportunistic, and if they can charge you sixty, they will charge you sixty for sure. But I'm saying that they might not be. First of all, they won't be a. That, that's the base version. Tesla sure. won't sell a base version Cybertruck for uh, until probably like 2025, 2026, I would think. 
Right. So we're still far away from that. They will go with the high end version first, like they always do. But yeah, by that time, uh, like the market is going to be way different by 2025, 2026. It might make sense to have a, a lower price version. Yeah, but there's going to be more inflation between now and then too. You think so? I don't think we're going to get down the control. Not crazy inflation like yeah. we had last year, but I think you know five or ten percent. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe they can get it down. Uh, and you know, I think Ford at some point is going to start lowering their prices too. I mean, we know that they lost what three million dollars, or they expect to lose three million dollars in the EV side of their business. So they're not making money. They're not, they don't have big margins. So it's yeah. not like they're being opportunistic here. Yeah. I don't think they're making much money off of that. All right. You had the chance to um, try out the latest version of blue cruise on the, on the Mustang Mikey. That's a good looking car right there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, nice color. Well, we took it up to Vermont. Uh, I drove it over to uh, Albany. Then I charged it at electrify america and it was quite slow and i was quite upset about it but then i drove it down the interstate um from albany to uh near new york city and that was like the only place around me that uh, blue cruise was blessed i mean we don't have a lot of interstates in our area but and there's none on the way to vermont for us so had to had to do it this way um so blue cruise is basically like super cruise um it's very similar uh GM Super Cruise is, you know, quite nice. The thing that Blue Cruise has improved on is that it's, you know, fully hands-free now. So when it's on, you don't have to have your hands anywhere near the steering wheel. Um, your eyes have to be up. They have to be kind of scanning around, looking around in front of you. But that's pretty much it. And, and do you know, they have a driver monitoring to, to, to make sure of that? Yeah, they have. Uh, you can see the steering wheel, like right at the stock. There's those two little things looking at you, and then above uh, the uh, rear view mirror, there's a little camera. Okay. And I don't know if the camera is actually part of the the suite, but it's basically very similar to um, Super Cruise. And I know, you know, there's Tesla folks who are like, you know, it can only go on certain roads. That's garbage. My Tesla can do autopilot on my driveway. I get it. That's for sure. Like Tesla's will do this at more places, but in places where super cruise and, and blue cruise work, it's a much better experience not to have to have your hand on the wheel. And you're, it feels much more like being a passenger. If you're just looking out, then if something happens, like for instance, um, a few sp spaces on this drive down, it said, Hey, grab the wheel, start beeping, grab the wheel. Uh, you know, there's an exit or on ramp or something that's confusing to me. So then it turns into kind of like the you know, Tesla autopilot where you have to touch the wheel and have weight on the wheel. But you can do that in a lot of places, too. So it, it it's a little bit of a crossover uh, technology. Um, the three things that uh, Ford upgraded here. Uh, actually, could you scroll up a little bit so I can I can remember these things? Um, lane change assist. Um, so. This is something that Tesla's done for a while. Uh, GM does it in some of their vehicles, not on the Bolt EV. Um, if you want to change lanes, it'll even suggest you change lanes. You just hit the stock, hit the turn signal. It changes lanes. It was super smooth. Um, Tesla's is also super smooth now, but the original first Tesla was kind of jerky. So that's that works great. My one gripe about it is that um it doesn't turn off the turn signal so you have to turn off the turn signal again which is you know silly but like you know work on that um predictive speed assist so this was a pretty straight roadway um but um when you are on sharper turns it does slow down a little bit um you won't even notice it or you're kind of it, it's kind of like what you would do anyway so it, it kind of feels natural um it's really helpful and i think the biggest thing um, and it's something that I wish Tesla would do as well, uh, in lane repositioning. So if you're passing a huge truck and, you know, the truck's like kind of close on the line, you, you like naturally want to be like away from the, the big truck or the vehicle in the other lane. And, uh, blue cruise will kind of just inch you over a little bit toward that line. As long as there's not something on the other side. V and... V11 does that with the full self-driving. Oh, does it? Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, that I really appreciate because, um, you know, there's times when I'm, you know, uh, doing, you know, a, a, just a 
traffic aware cruise control type of thing up the road and i'm pulling up close to a you know a, a bigger truck and i'm like uh why are we in the middle we should be on the left side of the road so that's nice mm -hmm. yeah speaking of like uh good timing to, to discuss it but uh because we were asked about it last week too i did get uh, the the v11 update the v11.3 3.3 something like that um uh, in um in my car, in my Model 3, that I, I use it when I drove down from Shawinigan to Montreal to, to, to fly out. So I just I just used it for like a 120, 140 kilometers or so. I was pleasantly surprised by it. It was is the first oh is the good. first update from full cell driving that I'm like, all right, this is this is starting to get something that I can get behind. Uh, but again, I used it mainly on the highway, and so I guess the biggest um, takeaway here is it, quen it quenched my concerns about the merging of the stack of the autopilot stack and the full self-driving for using the full self-driving stack on highway basically uh it was it performed very well on the highway uh one thing i should disclose first i i, I didn't i didn't like play with the the setting just yet so so some of my issues might be linked to the to the settings uh, for example the auto lane change uh, was super smooth for passing. Like I passed the vehicles super well, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that they include that. Uh, I didn't I didn't know it was called that in lane repositioning, but yes, th there's that. If you if you pass a big truck, uh, it will hug the left lane and and give you a lot of space to to to, to pass vehicles. So that's nice. Um, my, my only concern is it it wouldn't go back into the right lane after that. It would just do the asshole move of, of staying in the passing lane uh, for a while. And at first, I thought maybe, okay, I, I was the one that's like, normally I go back in a little bit sooner. But then a, a few times, I tried to give it as much time as possible, and it would just not go back into the right lane. Now, maybe that's a setting situation. I haven't, I haven't dove uh, deep into the, the setting just yet. Uh, but yeah, other than that, like the performance was very good. I didn't have any issues. The only thing that I, I didn't like, but that might just be a Quebec issue, is that uh, I, I kept getting alerts that, one or more cameras is having issues and that would uh, negatively affect full cell driving. Uh, it's just, this is the worst time of the year in Quebec right now. It, uh, it's slush everywhere and uh, you, you, it's so easy to get your camera super dirty. Uh, I tried to clean them up the best I could, but uh, apparently, uh, apparently this is still an issue. This is interesting about not going back into the right lane because uh, that's new. Like it, it has, has done that in the past. Yeah, when it passes, so maybe that's something merging the stacks issue or something. Yeah, but I, I'm sure there's settings involved too because I know that there's like a setting for um, how aggressive you you can you you can pass a vehicle too because you know when you go back into the right lane after passing a vehicle like it, sometimes the vehicle is in red and like it doesn't let you go back in the lane. So I, and, and sometimes I feel like it, it's a little bit too uh, passive uh, on that front because. I feel like I'm way past that vehicle. I should be able to go into the right lane right now safely. And it's telling me like, no, you cannot do it automatically because the vehicle is too close to you. And like, yeah, I don't know about that. Especially if I'm still I'm still not accelerating, but I'm, I'm driving faster than that vehicle. Like if I'm past it, I'm past it at this point. Uh, all right. We have uh, one more piece of news and then we're going to jump into the comment section. So if you guys have any questions for us about any of the subjects that we discussed today or any different subjects related to the electric vehicle world or uh, renewable energy, you can put them in the comment section right now. We're going to get to them in about, honestly, maybe <laughs> 30 seconds because that <laughs> last piece of news is not a big one. Uh, but I mean... Uh, it's it's big. It's not big. It's the Faraday feature announced that they finally started the production on the FF uh, ninety one, FF ninety one. I don't know how they they they, they, uh, they pronounce it, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting because obviously Faraday Future had a tumultuous history, but uh, we thought they were at the verge of dying a bunch of times, and 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 it's one of the very first like non-tesla ev startup too like we i've been reporting on faraday future since uh, i started out at electric basically which is eight years ago at this point so wow. they were one of the earliest non-tesla again i get non-tesla ev startup and for the longest time we're like oh, it's just gonna go away it's just gonna die they came so close to dying so often of course, honestly of I, I i thought they had died like, <laughs> a lot of controversies around the ceo to yt 
uh, was it YT? Uh, yeah, YT, yeah. Gia. So, uh, like a lot of controversy about the financing, like the taking over from Chinese investors and like uh, them claiming, oh, we're a U.S. company or a Chinese company or and then the buying of the factory, uh, like a, a textile factory too in, the, in California. And uh, finally, last year, they, they, they managed to secure some funding and um, they, uh, they are bringing that car to production. But also that car, the 91, like what is it like people are a little bit confused about what what they're trying to do with that car really and um it's a very high-end vehicle like i don't remember the exact pricing but i think it's like three hundred thousand dollars or something like that like it's not uh it's not cheap and jamie doesn't have the pricing here but yeah they went super high-end at some point yeah. I mean, we just talked about the Q8 having a giant 114 kilowatt hour battery pack. This has a 130 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, claiming a range of 381 miles, which is it's a big range. But you would think that it's not that big with uh, that kind of uh, battery pack. But it's also like just because of the the the, the, the power that the vehicle has, a hundred uh, uh, sorry, a thousand and fifty horsepower, uh, zero to sixty in two point two seconds, uh, which is not as fast as a tesla but it's it's a bigger car it's a, it's a big vehicle um, it's full size uh, almost like suv even though it's kind of a crossover form factor 200 kilowatt charging uh, capacity that's uh, that's good uh, nothing great but good and um self-driving capability like that that i don't know what they're talking about like if uh, if tesla can deliver self-driving i'm not gonna bet on far in the future delivering self-driving but you never know and uh, so production has officially started. Uh, they plan to open a store in Beverly Hills later this year and Los Angeles as, a, as an office in San Francisco, New York, Shanghai, Beijing. Uh, they, uh, they're going to start selling that thing. So, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm willing to go try it out. Yeah. You know, like ju just for, for like this, if we can actually drive and buy this thing after eight years of uh, almost dying. This is actually happening. It's uh were you Exciting. at the CES event where they drove us around in the back of one of those things? I wasn't there for that one of they. Yeah, so they they turned that into like a big super luxury thing. Like yeah. the the seats in the back felt like first class. I don't know if that's seats. still the case though. I don't. We don't yeah. have the pictures of the back seat, but I don't think it's not. That was probably like six years ago. Or something. I know it was a while. It's, it's not the same car. Do we have any pictures of the interior here? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, it's cool that they got to market. I see uh, JT and YF. Is that is that the initials now? Um, it's good to see that uh, they they got it across the finish line. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be extremely low volume, and then if that's it's not going to be getting like crazy uh, to um, to the EV market, but. They claim to have 14,000 unpaid reservation and 401 paid reservations. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't give any kind of value to those unpaid reservations because Yeah, I mean, you probably ordered one 8 years ago and you, yeah. probably, you probably you probably have a reservation. Yeah. <laughs> unpaid. People have bought like three different EVs since they, they actually right. reserved that car. All right, let's jump into the comments section. All right. Uh, we, we explained while we're on Thursday, uh, we have, um, other things going on. Uh, I really <laughs> thought it was Friday. Sorry about that. Um, so D Donald Boyd, uh, we talked about this, uh, the most recent FSD upgrade update, uh, did improve the product significantly, uh, for Fred. I still haven't gotten it on mine yet. I still haven't mm -hmm. got uh, V11, so. Uh, we'll find out. Okay, I don't know about significant. Like, it, it, I the main thing is like I'm not so concerned in, anymore about the merging of the stacks. I think the FSD is going to do great on the highway. I'm not going to lose. Uh, I'm not going to lose anything from what I loved about Autopilot, which I did, did love Autopilot on highway. It was a big thing for me. I, I love that about Tesla. So I'm not losing any of that. Now, am I going to use FSD on city streets more with V11 than I? did uh, before v11 i don't know just yet i would need to uh, use that use it more and especially i would need to do that uh, in the spring like you know once the, the snow gets away 
All right. Uh, do you know if the EV9 coming to the U.S. will have LFP or qualify for any of the tax credit when it comes out early next year? Uh, definitely won't have U.S. made batteries as far as I know. And I know that they were thinking about, I think, South Carolina or Alabama. I can't remember if they're producing those there. Yeah, I think they're going to be producing it in the U.S. Though that's that's the, right. I don't know about the batteries. I don't know about LFP too. I don't think I don't think Kyo is big on LFP just yet. Yep, LFP is still very much a Chinese thing right now. Speaking it's, of, it's, of yeah, speaking yeah. of LFP, uh, Bloomberg came out with a report that Tesla and Cattle are thinking about doing a battery factory in the U.S. Reportedly copying Ford ownership licensing structure. Um, I did take a quick look at that. It's light on yeah. details. It's saying uh, maybe in Texas, um, yeah. but there's no there's no details or. Yeah, we uh, pro- we we pretty much talked about that last week. Like it would make we we know it's coming. Like we know that Tesla is going to have LFP cell production in the U.S. It's more right. about when. We still don't know from that report when, but apparently they they disclosed to the White House that they're also working on that. All right, Nick Cedar question. Insurance companies are saying any crash damage to a battery is a total. Does the structural battery now seem like not such a great idea? Well, I mean I mean the, you just contradict to yourself. Like if yeah. if it's a total it's already anyway, total. like it doesn't doesn't change anything. So I would um I I get where the concern comes from. Uh it's it's more the the biggest concern is more like um now, even if, but, but apparently Tesla, the, the sides, uh, side rails are still not considered a battery pack. Like they can, they are replaceable. So it, it shouldn't be that big of a concern. But yeah, if you do have battery damage, like I said, it's it's total, and um, that that would happen either way if you have a massive crash, in my opinion. So it's not. Uh, I wouldn't think it's a big deal. All right, question. Who is using pouch cells and who is using cylindrical and which form do you think will prevail? Um, you know, Tesla, I mean, it's, it's, it's still the case that basically everyone other than uh, Tesla is using uh, pouch cells uh, and, and the, the new startups do also using cylindrical like uh, Lucid and whatnot. But um, yeah, most are still using pouch cell and Tesla is also using pouch cell for the LFPs. So uh, which form is going to prevail? I think, I think we're going to see... Uh, a mix it's going to be a mix going forward mix of chemistry and mix of format um unless unless the 4680 just kills everything uh and 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 becomes so much better and there's a chance that that's going to happen because we've seen other automakers being uh, very excited about 4680 since Tesla announced it so maybe 4680 prevails and cylindrical cells are, are the thing um but my gut instinct right now tells me that's going to be a mix all right. Uh, I hope Tesla goes forward with a dual motor Cybertruck, even if they don't get the dry electrode working in time. Uh, I don't think the dry electrode or the 4680 is going to be a concern for the motor configuration on the Cybertruck. Yeah. All right. Uh, Stefan Frokar noticed that Tesla Solar Roof never say that they're US only product, but it is. It has been. For sale outside the U.S., but never delivered outside. That's true. N- nowhere That's in true. There's been there's been uh, things in Canada going on. I remember, like last year, there's been uh, things about like looking for roofers and solar installers that mentioned solar roof, but uh, nothing has actually been delivered, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, based on uh, Stephen's name, I assume he's not from Canada; it's from a European and Scandinavian market. And yes, so that's uh, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath about the solar roof making its way there. All right. Uh, it's amazing how much more range Lucid gets out of the same battery size as the A8. Everyone should be working toward efficiency, not larger batteries. That's a great point. It's um, a great Lucid. point, but uh, the Lucid is also a sedan versus uh, uh, the A8. What's the A8? The Q is he, is he talking about the Q8? Q8 I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's also true for the um, the uh, uh, the one I saw that. <laughs> Blank on the name, the Volvo and the uh, Polestar uh, oh, yeah. three, Polestar three, same size battery, but a hundred less miles range. Mm-hmm. All right, Key oh, gets Nic- there. Nikola yeah. Motor just announced a hundred million dollars public offering. 
Ooh, I'll jump right on that. Uh, then uh, Kia gets their larger, longer range by underpowering the motor. It does seem like that's one of the components of uh, getting better range is having a low power motor. Um, that that uh, EV9 that's going to have a Chevy Bolt motor in it is going to be yeah. a good example of that. Um, Brian Woods uh, from LinkedIn, how would you measure the social impact of the repair it yourself or does it aff offend to marketing communities that ask that? I don't remember what we were talking about at that point. I don't understand the question either. Uh. Uh, he's got more questions, but I don't know if they're where are the metrics coming from. If I own an F-150, what is the market worth for somebody purchasing one and budgeting an entire year? I'll buy a Nissan. Okay, well, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. Andrew McDonald, what is your opinion of the value of Sandy Monroe's opinion of Tesla lead in design and engineering? Grain of salt. Take it with a grain of salt. Well, you should think pretty much every commentator of Tesla, including herself, <laughs> with a grain of salt. Everyone mm -hmm. is biased and everything. Um I mean, Sandy does good things with like the teardowns and whatnot. Like we we do get some insight, but um, a lot of things that he's done, I also like don't put too much value in it. Like the, for example, like the the biggest one that I was disappointed about, like when he got the the Elon Musk interview, I thought that was like a complete waste of time. He was basically just patting Elon on the back for an hour. Like if you get we get access to Elon. I, I know that Elon is probably not an easy interview to do. And if you don't do that, maybe that's the only Elon interview you're ever going to do. Right. But uh, I don't know. I, would, I just I wouldn't be able to do that uh, personally. I will uh, also say, like, you know, by omission, I feel like Sandy has kind of, uh, you know, pumped up the Tesla's positive points. Yeah. But um, not the negative points. And And anecdotally, I will say that, you know, some journalists were talking about how, uh, you know, how bad FSD was. And, you know, Sandy was right in there with yeah. them saying, like, FSD is really like, you know, a two year old driving. But publicly, and I, he doesn't I, say that. I don't think he would ever say something like that publicly, at least not, you know, in the current climate. So you know, I think Sandy is a great example of uh, capture. Like the, the Tesla fans have captured them. Like they, you know, because because if you remember, like, Early on with the Model 3, Sandy was extremely anti-Tesla. He trashed the Model 3 and everything, and he got trashed by Tesla fans. And then, boom, he switched. He was like, all right, like, I have a big Tesla fan and everything. And like the Tesla fan embraced that. Like, we got him. We got him. He's, he's on board right now. He's one and, of us. Uh, and that, things like that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that initially, like, he, I, I think that it makes more sense that he would be pro-Tesla than anti-Tesla, especially as a, uh, automotive engineer i think there's a lot to love about tesla from a, a, an engineering standpoint but at the same time you have to ask yourself what what does that entails in terms of of bias and, it, and it's i'm not also i'm not trying to trash him like that like it's a hard thing for everyone to do including for ourselves to, to try to maintain a, uh as unbiased opinion as we can get which is being completely unbiased is, is impossible in my opinion but yeah, and he's a smart guy, uh, you know, kind of from a different era, comes from the internal combustion era, but I think he's made trans the transition over pretty well. Not all of his contemporaries have, so. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do you think anything new or exciting will be unveiled at the upcoming NY Auto Show? I think the new Kona EV will be there. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be there. We got invited for a couple things. Um, like I said, I'm going to L.A., so I'm not going to be there, at least not for the the media days. Um, there was something else that was there. I don't know. Uh, remember, I told you you could come down to New York and go to it. Yeah, well, that was the key. <laughs> no, that was the EV9 uh, debut. Oh, that's but, right. That was yeah. EV9. Maybe they'll have a price. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, FSD version 11 has minimal lane change button in the settings. Maybe that's the. Uh, Oh, maybe I have that activated. Maybe that's what Dan means. No, that's possible. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if it's default, if it's def you saying that that's what is on by default. Uh, if it's not on by default, then I definitely not didn't activate that because I didn't touch the setting at all, at all. Okay. 
And then uh, back to the Cybertruck comment, I don't think the 500 mile range version, try or quad, will happen without the 26, sorry, the 4680 dry electrode battery. Ah, uh, okay. If that's what was the meaning of the other question, yeah, yeah, that's that's probably true. I just think that y y the, um, yeah, the, the motor configuration is not going to be affected by the 4680 having dry electrode or not. Uh, but yes, uh, that, I mean, 500 miles on the cyber truck is probably dependent of on optimizing 4680 cells to the max or near the max. And um, mm -hmm. we're not quite there yet. No, when, apparently not. Yeah. All right. That's all the questions. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening to the show this week. We appreciate you taking the time uh, on the last minute change to a Thursday show. And um, if you do enjoy the show, please give us a thumbs up, a like, whatever it is on the app that you're listening right now. If you are listening to the audio only version on podcast, which is most of you, uh, we appreciate you guys too, even though if you cannot tune in live. And if you can give us a five star review on your podcast app, that helps the show a lot. It takes a minute to do and uh, we read all the reviews. We got a few ones last week. We appreciate you guys that did that. Um, it, uh, it helps boost us in the chart and, and it helps up. Uh, reach more people and about the electric revolution so uh thanks a lot everyone and we're gonna see you next week 